Factorials are one of my absolute favorite things to talk about. They have a wide variety of use cases, tons of incredible patterns, and they seem to show up everywhere in mathematics. Now, factorials of positive integers are easy enough to compute. For example, 5 factorial is just 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. Where things get a little bit more interesting is extending this definition to non-integers. And in this video, we're going to tackle an especially interesting one, I factorial. What could this possibly be? This is certainly not an integer, and it's not even a real number. I squared is negative one. Off the bat, it might not seem entirely clear how we're going to figure this out, but it's all based on the famous gamma function. I've talked about the gamma function extensively on this channel, and if you want to see where it comes from, click the video card in the top right of the screen. This might be an integral definition, but we're not going to use any integration in this video, just the properties of the gamma function, namely that it recursively defines factorials for non-integer values. And in this case, we're extending the definition to complex numbers as well. To do this, we're going to need a few tools of complex numbers along with the gamma function. Now, it might be slightly unfortunate that gamma of z is not z factorial, it's z minus one factorial, Gamma of z plus 1 is the same as z times gamma of z. This is due to the recursive nature of factorials. 5 factorial is the same as 5 times 4 factorial. And if we're extending this to the complex numbers, gamma of i plus 1 should be i times gamma of i. Let's save that, we're going to use it later. We're also going to use a quite famous reflection formula using the gamma function. That is gamma of one minus z times gamma z is the same as this fraction. We're not going to get into where this comes from. That's a topic for another day. Likewise, this should extend to complex numbers. Talking specifically about properties of complex numbers, when I talk about absolute value, or you might call it the modulus, we think of that as the distance to the origin. For example, if I plot i by itself in the complex plane where the real axis is horizontal, the imaginary axis is vertical, i is one unit up along the vertical axis, hence the absolute value of i should be 1, its distance to the origin. And this would be true of any number in the complex plane. Just keep in mind, typically numbers are two-dimensional in the complex plane. What makes this especially interesting with our gamma function? Since gamma of 1 plus i is the same as i times gamma of i, they have the same absolute value. The absolute value of gamma of 1 plus i is the same as the absolute value of i times the absolute value of gamma of i, and we just saw the absolute value of i is 1. Thus, gamma of 1 plus i and gamma of i have the same absolute value. This is going to be very important for our calculation a little bit later. Finally, I need to talk about the complex conjugates. The idea isn't too tough. The conjugate of a complex number just makes the imaginary part negative. Effectively, it's reflecting over the horizontal axis. When it comes to the gamma function, without getting too technical, the gamma function is an analytic continuation of a real function, so the gamma of z conjugate is the conjugate of gamma z. The reason I bring it up is because of a nice property we'll need to take advantage of. If I multiply a number by its conjugate, that's the same as squaring its modulus, squaring its absolute value. All right, we have all of the main tools. Let's try to figure out what I factorial should be. We're gonna start with the recursive formula evaluated at z equals 1 plus i. That means instead of writing z, 
I write 1 plus I, and we have gamma of 1 minus 1 plus I times gamma of 1 plus I. Or simplifying, that's gamma of negative I times gamma of 1 plus I. Here's where it gets just slightly tricky. Gamma of negative I, that's the same thing as gamma of I conjugate. If you think about what the conjugate is, it's just negating the imaginary part of a complex number. So 0 plus i conjugate would just be negative i. And we said that gamma of z conjugate is the same as the conjugate of gamma z. Now I'll use the recursive definition of the gamma function on gamma of 1 plus i. That's the same as i times gamma of i like before. So this turns into i times gamma i times conjugate gamma i. Why is that nice? Because we can apply that property of conjugates. z times z conjugate is the modulus squared, the absolute value squared. So i times the absolute value of gamma i squared is this recursive relationship. Now, that's pretty cool in and of itself, but we were going for i factorial. Remembering that the absolute value of gamma i is the same as the absolute value of gamma of 1 plus i, let's make that switch because gamma of 1 plus i is i factorial. Now all we have to do is algebraically solve for i factorial. Now it's a little bit of a pain because it's an absolute value, but the absolute value of i factorial is still a pretty good solution. Just divide both sides by i. And I know I told you we had all the tools, but I didn't want to overwhelm you at the start. There's two more definitions we can use here, namely the definition of hyperbolic sine and Euler's formula we can use to simplify this expression. Sine of pi times 1 plus i, this is basically the reciprocal of the complex sine function. We can play around with properties of exponents, cancel out those i's, apply Euler's formula, e to the i pi is negative 1, and this happens to be the definition, or rather the reciprocal definition, of hyperbolic sine of pi. So pi over hyperbolic sine of pi is the absolute value of i factorial squared, or i factorial is the square root of pi over hyperbolic sine of pi. If you like that result, I bet you're dying to know what i to the i power is as well. You can check that out by clicking the video on the screen. I'll see you in that one.